We're still right on the Wednesday edition of New Dawn, and this is the interview segment where we look at critical issues. And this morning, we're looking at something that concerns all of us, and it's becoming a, a worrisome issue. Uh, it's been ongoing for some time, and now I think it's getting to its peak with some developments in the past few weeks. And even some other issues that we are still going to unravel in the course of the discussion. And what are we talking about? Oil theft in Nigeria. Investigating oil theft, we want to look at the various dimensions and then the implications for our economy. We want to also see what are the things that we need to do. Are there, is there any hope in sight or is this how it's going to continue? To join this discussion this morning and help us shed more light we have via Zoom, right from the United Kingdom, an oil and gas expert, Tayo Okuboyejo. Tayo, we'd like to welcome you to New Dawn this morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me. All right. Um, if we have an oil and gas expert there, we also have a chartered accountant here who has the books, the story of the books. Is a man of many parts. is involved in management. Is a fellow. He's done a lot you know, within the structure to understand what we're talking about. And um, it's with joy I want to welcome to Sam Singh or Debo to uh, New Dawn this morning. It is my pleasure to be here. Good morning, everybody. All right. Now, we, let's begin straight away uh, with the oil and gas expert there, Tayo. Oil has become Nigeria's mainstay kind of even though we feel by now government should have diversified and we should have um, moved into other things because of the vagaries within the system but now when you look at the peculiarity of oil in nigeria and the fact that things are getting you know more or less like a, a downward you know fall now we are looking at oil theft with it. What are the implications of this for the Nigerian economy? Oh, God. Uh, where, where, where do we begin? So I, I think to begin with, um, if, if theft in the oil industry or, or the theft of oil continues unabated, we are potentially looking at the Nigerian state becoming broke. Okay. And you know what that means for not just the federal government, but for the state governments that rely on, you know, allocation from the sales of crude. You know, it's essentially how the Nigerian, the Nigerian state and its subnational states are financed. So, if, if this continues unabated, you know, the, the Nigerian state is looking at becoming bankrupt. And the reason for that is that um, we have not been able to successfully diversify our economy to the point where reliance on oil receipts is low enough where we can, we can say that we have other sources of income. So that's number one. Then number two, now, with oil being Nigeria's largest um, forex earner, and the Nigerian state, or shall I say the Nigerian economy, hardly doing enough in terms of exports. So you're essentially saying that the Naira as a currency, it's not a, it's not a currency that is of value to anyone outside Nigeria. You are also looking at, you know, 
perhaps a complete depression of the Naira. So, so the, the issues are quite multifaceted. And until we're able to find some solutions to this theft, and increasing theft, I might add, then, you know, the, the future is indeed very bleak. I am very sad to, to admit, even to myself. All right. Okay. Uh, well, uh, now to uh, Chief Odebo. As a financial expert, um, the World Bank has said Nigeria had the largest uh, shortfall among oil producing uh, countries during the first quarter. And we've not been able to meet um, the OPEC uh, quota of 1.8 million barrels you know, per day. So how, how precarious is this situation you know, for us economically? Well, thank you. It is very, very precarious to the economy. Just like uh, <clears throat> Uh, Mariama just said, so you see, oil is the mainstay of the economy in terms of foreign exchange earning, and it has a lot of salutation effect on the economy. Number one, if you don't, if you don't meet your, your supply, it means that there, there's going to be a, short, a, a sort of shortfall in the supply. Shortfall in supply means that there will be a shortfall in the revenue that, that will be coming to Nigeria. So let me get it straight. Oil theft in Nigeria is not new. It has been there for a very, very long time. And that has been the bane of our economy. We are not able to meet our, our international supply. We are not able to meet uh, the foreign exchange that has to come in from that source. And that has, has accounted for low revenue generation in Nigeria. It has also accounted for the exchange rate that is on the high side. And it's also accounted for the inflation, uh, lack of job, and so many other things in the economy. Salutarily, it, it is a doom to the economy. Like I said earlier, you see, when you talk of the oil industry in Nigeria, it, is, uh, it, it has a lot of shady practices, lack of transparency, lack of so many other things. There has never been any empirical evidences to ensure that we have regular accounting control, regular uh, measure of the oil, number of oil that, actually, that is actually exported. And then we don't even know how many liters of oil that we are consuming in this country. We don't know how many liters of oil that have been imported into the country. We don't know so many things about, about the oil. In terms of pricing, in terms of so many things, it is very, very shady. Mm -hmm. But we thank God by the, what the privatization of NNPC, yeah. I think things are coming down. I think it's the first time that NNPC will declare dividend mm -hmm. uh, in the history of NNPC in this country. And that is what we have been advocating for, that NNPC should be a full-fledged company on its own. But the side side of it is that the shares of NNPC as are today is not widely spread. It is owned by only two, and that is the uh, uh, Minister of Finance Incorporated and the NNPC itself. And when you look at the board of directors, they, have, they are not stakeholders in the industry. So these areas that I've just mentioned need to be addressed again. The shares should be widely spread, widely spread in the sense that the workers there must have a number of shares, the community in which this, uh, uh, this oil and so, and so on and so forth passes must also have their own share and so on and so forth, before that industry can be fully developed. Okay. Then another area is that uh, we are, when we talk of oil theft, we are talking of both refined petroleum okay. and other areas, and we are also talking about the crude oil. That is, we are talking about the mainstream sector and then the downstream sector as well as the uh, upstream sector of the economy. When you look at the two, they are covered with secrecy hmm. all over the time. Then you will recall, sir, and mass, that there has been a lot of investigation panels that were set up in the past. And then the submissions here reveal irreconcilable and oh, yeah. submissions. Uh, in, uh, time will not permit me. We have what I dare say, uh, as Sani said about it, we had a lot of things that were said by those various panels in those days. Uh, all theft and all investigation is not new in Nigeria, but 
what is the end result of all these investigations. Okay, we are still going to come to you, but now let me come to Tayo. Uh, I'm sure you have heard him, and um, you know the the question I want to ask now because oil theft, uh, uh, there are so many dimensions to it. One of which is the subsidy. Normally, we've always we are, we are currently looking at pipeline vandalization and all of that and diversion, but I still we're still going to come to that. But then, what's your own take on subsidy? You know, because some people feel that has been, you know, um, the network where a lot of um, funds, as I found out of the country, do we, are we, is, is, is the sector subsidized now? What exactly are we doing? What, what is the state of the oil sector within the purview of our own discussion? I'm going to start with um, a comment from um, the former Emir of um, Bayou, um, uh, Sanu Silamido. Okay. So, you know, there was an interview, I mean, or maybe a speech where he said something along the lines of, how is it possible that we have no records of the ships that birth into Nigeria and how much uh, refined crude they bring in. So this is the first, you know, the first issue. So you think about, okay, you know, I don't want to talk about, you know, all the issues around, we don't have working refineries and all of that. You know, that's like a, it's a whole, you know, <laughs> network of issues on its own. But talking about, you know, this idea of, of subsidy, so to begin with, the price that we pay for, you know, refined crude, i.e., you know, what we pay for uh, petrol and uh, kerosene, we know that even as of today, it's still um, subsidized, mm -hmm. you know, by the Nigerian state. However, in terms of liters or in terms of volumes, we still do not have clear accounting of how much refined crude okay. is brought into Nigeria. So, and because of that, it leaves room for, you know, shady actors to come in and get paid by the Nigerian state for, you know, volumes of refined crude that has not really been brought in. And so, because we have no clear accounting as, um, you know, the, the gentleman said earlier, it's kind of difficult for you to be able to say, right, okay, this is how much the Nigerian state consumes. This is how much company X has brought in. Therefore, this is how much the Nigerian state has to pay to company X. Okay. So all of this, you know, you know, shall I say cloudiness or even, you know, opacity. So I, I, I won't even call it cloudy. Because if it's cloudy, at least yeah, you're you you seeing something. Of, uh... It's like completely opaque. You know, so because of that, it's, you know, I suppose people just wake up and decide, okay, I'm going to get into this thing. I'm, you know, I want to become an overnight millionaire. Where's the easiest, where's the easiest sector where this can be possible and uh, I can pretty much get away with it. Oh, let me go into, um, well, you know, <laughs> bringing in refined, refined crew. So there's one side of that. Now, the other side of that is that because of what subsidy represents to Nigeria and to the economy of the state or to, to individuals, there have been several calls to have a sub subsidy completely removed. Now, I am, I am kind of in the middle with respect to that because I kind of consider oil subsidy as the only welfare that the Nigerian states provides to its citizen. Like, you know, if you want to talk about safety nets, you know, where here in the UK you have the government paying people, I don't know, job seekers allowance in the US, you have food stamps and, you know, other states, those kind of safe safety nets are, are there. In Nigeria, the only safety net that the poor have in Nigeria is um, subsidy. And I believe that the Nigerian state has gotten to the point where there is enough data for us to be able to specifically 
you know, continue to support those people, as opposed to a blanket removal of subsidy that some people have clamored for. Because when you do that, you are essentially throwing millions of Nigerians into further poverty, whereas we're trying to do the opposite. You know, we're trying to lift people out of poverty. So, I mean, I guess in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say here is that the Nigerian state has to find a way to, sub to continue to support its um, citizens that are poor, that are, you know, the people who rely on the welfare that comes in the form of oil subsidy. And then secondly, the Nigerian state has to find a way of clean and clear accounting practices that makes it transparent, like what exactly happens in the industry, who brings what's in. I am told that there's, you know, there's data available that if, we are, if the political will to pursue this is there, that you know, we, we can, we can okay. get okay. this data. This data is readily available from, from, from third parties. If okay. and when we do that is now the, the issue. Okay, uh, well, uh, quickly, Mrs. Okuboyejo, let me just keep this in. It seems uh, everyone is waiting for uh, Dangote refinery uh, to start running. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that a game changer? Well, it depends on how you see it, because you have to remember that, um, number one, Dangote is going to have to sell at um, spot you know, market prices. So does that mean that we are going to pay Dangote at market prices and then... Um, subsidized outside after we paid him or and I, yeah and then in addition to that i think nigeria has the, the, the government the federal government bought a 20 percent stake in in dangote refinery operations so what we do with that 20 percent is another issue so are we going to essentially use our 20 percent to you know supply the needs within nigeria and then buy the rest of dangote but I suppose it, it all depends on how it's done. It, it depends on the policy around the the the, the um, you know the the the, the, the arrangement that we currently have with Dangote Refinery. But I, I expect perhaps if we do what we're supposed to do, we should see some we should see some reduction, a very very heavy reduction in the amount of. Um, opacity in, in, in um, oil subsidy payments specifically. I mean, it's what, seven trillion now? <laughs> Who is consuming all this? Stuff? Okay, now, <laughs> let, me, let me come to Chief Odebo in the house here. Yeah. Um, okay, she's painted another <laughs> picture, yeah. which, we, you know, it's a little scary. Now, well, the question I want to ask is, Okay, we're talking about Dangote, Dangote refinery, we're doing all of that. But we had refineries before. Is it that, and then there, there was turnaround maintenance, there was it. Is it that our own refineries are so moribund that nothing can be done, that we have to every time take, you know, a crude outside the country, bring it back, and it doesn't even make economic sense to me, you know? And is it that we don't have audit, you know, we don't have informed people within government who are concerned, you know, what exactly is going on? Thank you. We have informed people. We have good people. But the problem is mismanagement of these policies that we have. In, uh, we have. My sister has submitted a lot of things okay. to, uh, to our discussion. But in the first instance, that measure of taking our crude overseas yes. and then bringing them back it's a very, very, very bad policy, and it's inimical to the economy of Nigeria. Is that not theft in its own right? Uh, well, I will call it uh, corruption, mismanagement, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Let me come in now. You see, in Nigeria, uh, Professor David Tam West, okay. yeah. I think it's late now, one time minister yeah, of, uh, of uh, uh, yes, he said, that 445,000 barrels of crude oil yeah. are being allocated to the four refineries in this country on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And there are 159 liters of, of only PMS okay. from one barrel of crude oil. 
if we are allocating 445,000 uh, barrels, yeah. multiplied like that, that is only PMS. Aside that, there are other 30 derivatives okay. from that okay. as uh, byproducts. In the first instance, if this thing is uh, exported, the yeah. crude oil, yeah. and you, now, you are now bringing back to us only refined petroleum, okay. what about other products, byproducts? Okay. That's number one. Number two, the employment generation that will have been generated from that source is not being generated. And that accounted for a uh, lack of employment opportunities in this country. You see, when you look at the petroleum industry, it is full of so many things. The petrochemical is there, and so many other things that will have created a lot of jobs for our people. But because they are not being refined in this country, it means that we are losing economically, socially, and so, and so on and so forth. Now, having said that, you asked me about refineries, right, yeah. whether they are more rebound. I have submitted earlier that during the probe processes, I submitted to these various panels, there has been a, a lot of revelations, okay. irreconcilable submissions that were given at that time. Okay. Number one, a lot of money has been spent on turnaround maintenance Turn yeah. over the years on these uh, okay. things that we are talking about. Yeah. Number two, uh, the refineries are not working. They are not producing anything. They are characterized by varied cost. Uh, salaries are being paid to, to the staff that are there, and so on and so, on and so forth. Uh, another side of it is that there has been a rumor, let me call it a rumor, okay. that even the petroleum, uh, the finished PMS that, that, is, uh, that is imported into this country okay. also find their way okay. to the sea again. <laughs> then there are a lot of leakages here and there. You see, what I'm trying to submit here is that in the first instance, there is no need for subsidy. And that is why I've always been submitting that I regard that thing as perceived subsidy. Okay. Because it has never been proved uh, the number of PMS yeah. that is being imported into this country, the quantity, or the, uh, the quantity that is being imported, even the pricing system itself cannot be objectively uh, analyzed. So because of all these secrecies here, yeah. lack of transparency yeah. here, and so on and so forth, I don't believe there is subsidy. I call it perceived subsidy. subsidy. Okay. Like I said earlier, if 159 liters of PMS alone yeah. can be taken, can be, can, be, can be produced from one barrel of crude oil, multiply 159 times 445,000 per day, that will give you almost 70, mm -hmm. 70 million liters of PMS alone in this country. If that is in place, do we need to, subs uh, to, uh, so to pay subsidy? Okay. Aside from that, if we now refine our petroleum, petroleum here and then we export the, the excesses yeah. to African and neighboring countries in Naira, yeah. that will have enhanced yeah. Yeah, our, uh, our, our, our Naira. So there is a lot of things that can be done within the, this industry that we can use to develop other core sectors of the economy. OK, uh, well, uh, now to uh, Mrs. Oku uh, Boyejo. Uh, this is quite baffling. Uh, maybe you could try to make sense you know, of this for us, uh, having worked uh, with uh, some oil companies uh, in Nigeria and beyond. Uh, Nigeria, unfortunately, is the only uh, OPEC member uh, unable to uh, refine its crude you know, for domestic uh, consumption. Uh, despite having four refineries uh, that are, well, moribund. And uh, like we recall <laughs> that last year, NMPC claimed uh, to have uh, committed over 100 billion naira uh, alone uh, for, for their maintenance. So what are we maintaining if the refineries are not working? Over 100 billion naira just for maintenance. <laughs> so uh, let me be corrected two sentences there. Number one, uh, all of my oil and gas experience is outside of Nigeria. I, I didn't work in Nigeria, so I don't want anybody to get, uh, to get upset there. And then secondly, um, with respect to the refineries, in fact, there is, a, there is a headline from Business Day, I think from last year, 
So between 20, 2020 and today, the Nigerian economy or the Nigerian government has, you know, spent 5.9 billion US dollars on refinery maintenance and not one barrel of oil has been refined by, you know, this refineries. So you then begin to wonder, like, you know, are we better off, you know, completely taking this thing apart? Should we call in, you know, investors to buy the refinery out completely? Or should we, you know, forget about, you know, refinery operations and have something similar to what uh, Alagi Ali Kudangote is doing and just, you know, issue out licenses for, for refineries and have refineries, you know, deals around the country. And I don't know the answer to, to that. But one thing that is clear is that I personally think that uh, the continued maintenance of our refineries needs to stop. Because if we have expended, if the Nigerian state has expended six billion, and you know, approximately six billion US dollars within three years, and none of these refineries have been able to complete whatever turnaround that they are meant to do enough to be able to you know, at least provide enough for our local consumption. And I think it's time to pull the plug on um, allocating or appropriating funds towards um, towards uh, maintaining those refineries. I'm not sure they are, they are ever going to produce anything. So that's one one side of it. The other side of it, like you said, is that you know, with with um, Nigeria having purchased 20% equity in, you know. Um, Dangote refinery. It, it remains to be seen what we what we do with that. And then I suppose with um, with uh, I, I imagine that um, you know Aliko Dangote is going to be the operator of that refinery. And of course, this is a businessman. He's not going to run a business to run it aground. Perhaps the kind of transparency that we want and we need to see enough to be able to even ascertain what our actual local consumption is, and then maybe begin to make some plans around that would then become, would be, become obvious. You know, you know, Chief stated some numbers earlier on, and that's the numbers that has been, you know, banded around for years. Like, you know, our local consumption is 70 million liters per day. But I'm not even sure that's true because, you know, how did, how did we come about that, that, that figure? No, no one knows. Now, let me now come to Chibodebo here because it, it, it is a little cloudy. It looks like the more you look, the less you see, you know. And the, 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 the question you are asking yourself is, you know, in a country where people are well informed or supposedly well informed, you look at how much has been spent on the refineries, you know, the maintenance, you know, okay, a business mogul now is building his own refine. Is it that the government, when you take into consideration how much has been spent, you know, you take it out of the country to refine and then you bring it back, is it that government cannot generate that funds, even if it's on a loan, uh, to get his own loan and then get this thing resolved and put a functional refinery because even when you have a modular refinery or whatever now uh, it's you, it's no longer in the, within the purview of the government and you are asking yourself okay after all these monies that you have spent what have you come out of what what has come out of it and you know you you want to say okay does it mean that records are so difficult to keep does it mean that even when you come we're still going to look at vandalization you know there are some of these things that there are cctvs you know that should be capturing movements and all of that and then you find is it rocket science why can't these things work well 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 you see i am not in government okay so i cannot speak for them you are not a politician i am not a politician okay i am a professional to the core okay uh, with core competencies in managerial financial uh, advisory services in all the sectors of the economy okay. with so many years of experiences. But I know all these things you are talking about are very, very possible, okay. given the political will and so on and so forth. Like in the first instance, like I've just said, let me shock you again. Okay. Recently, 
there was a proposal, a proposed policy of spending 1.5 billion billion dollar to rehabilitate Portaco refinery. Okay. I don't know how far that has gone today. And when you talk of petrochem uh, Portaco refinery, mm -hmm. it contains a lot of things. Yeah. Petrochemical is there, as well as so forth. If you if you, you are going to spend 1.5 billion dollars, convert it. That's true. That That's that yeah. amount of money to uh, to rehabilitate just one mm -hmm. refinery. Mm -hmm. How much does it cost to have to build a mm -hmm. one refinery? Mm -hmm. We have the refinery that we are talking about that can be built. Mm -hmm. We have modular. Okay. We have plastic. Okay. We have so many other things. And then those people that are now being tagged as what do they call it in the Nigeria mm -hmm. data? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 processing crude oil, okay. maybe in a crude way. Why don't you organize them? Yeah. Bring them together, uh, train them, give them licenses, and then you allocate crude, uh, crude oil to them. Okay. Why don't you do that? Why don't you make, why don't you make the use of uh, domestic resources yeah. to actually do all these things? You see, like I said, I, I said earlier, there has been a lot of, a lot of irreconcilable differences yes. being submitted to the various uh, pa uh, pro panel. Uh, my sister said 70 million liters of petrol. Yeah. Uh, I, am not, uh, I am not the author of that thing. Okay. It is Professor uh, uh, David Tang yeah. West. Okay. He said, okay. it's okay. okay, he said, there are 445,000 uh, liters, 1,000 uh, barrels of crude oil being allocated to the four refineries. That is the production, production capacity okay. of the four refineries. And then he said, you will get 159 liters of PMS alone okay. from one barrel. Multiply 155 times that number. Okay. That will give you PMS of about 70 million per day minimum. If it is not, if it is not working at full capacity, it can be less. Okay. But at least it will cover the domestic uh, uh, need. And then we will have access to export to other areas. Now, we are talking of giving licenses to people. Are the environment conducive? Yeah. How much do they pay for licenses that will be issued? Okay. How much do they pay for the cost of doing business in the country? Okay. What, is the, uh, what is the security environment of the country that will attract investors to really come in? Okay. These are the areas. What about the issue of... Uh, uh, energy sector. Okay. These are the areas that must be looked into, that must be addressed okay. before these people can come in. The future is bright for us because we have the resources, both in terms of human and material resources. We have intelligent people. We have people of integrity, but they will not be allowed to get to, uh, to, 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 that, to that corridor. So the future is very bright. We have the resources. We have the we are with that. Or we have the policies. The policies are good. There's no doubt about it. But the problem we have in this country is the management of those policies, management of the systems. We are talking of the totality of the, uh, uh, the environmental factors, the systems. People normally blame systems. I don't blame systems. I blame the operators of the systems, the systems. because the yeah. systems are there. The policies are there, very good, very fine on paper. But who are the policy? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me take on uh, Tayo here. Very recently, let's even move away now from subsidy. Let's look at pipeline, vandalization, pipeline. You know, is, is it not sad that it has to take somebody, you know, um, that you pay you know, uh, to go and for him to discover that uh, the legal pipeline, and you are asking yourself, don't we have uh, armed forces that are guarding, that are supposed to be monitoring, you know, and the first one, we've, we've discovered another one now, maybe that guy is doing justification for his money and all of that, and you are asking yourself, okay, how did things get this bad? Is it that the military you know, there was even one that they said is behind the military base or something, you know. Is, it, is that collaboration so deep that anybody who is going to break it might break his head? So, I, I, I think that some of the headlines in the past week, 
Okay. About um, discovery of um, secret pipelines has to be one of the one of the greatest um, uh, shame that all of us as a country have to bear. Because when you think about uh, pipelines, to the best of my knowledge, pipelines form part of uh, critical infrastructure for any state. And I imagine for Nigeria too. So case in point, and I usually don't like comparing countries with Nigeria, but in this instance, I'm going to do that comparison. So, so in the UK, you have um, an agency called the Oil Pipelines Agency. And the job of this agency, you know, so this agency was established by statute, i.e. it's backed by a legislative law that was passed in the parliament. And this agency is a sub-agency of the Ministry of Defense. So this, so, so you are talking about a network of pipelines that is, um, that is secured and maintained by the Ministry of Defense. Similarly, I, I checked that I looked into the US and I found something similar as well. And the reason for this is that these two countries understand and know the importance of securing you know, energy supplies for their country. So, and I can imagine that any country that, you know, that is that's serious about securing infrastructure or securing their state would be doing anything different. Now, you now come to Nigeria, and I remember that one of the first questions, you know, I, I was asking myself was, we still have a, we still have a defense ministry in Nigeria. Like, mm -hmm. how? How did this happen? Like, so the, the people who are responsible, I mean, I've, I've seen people ask questions like, um, oh, how could the Navy not know about this? But in my head, I'm asking myself, well, I'm sure there are agencies of the NFPC itself yeah. that it's their job to secure these pipelines. Yeah. Who, wh where, is, where are these agencies? The people who are responsible for managing these agencies, where are they? Why aren't we asking them questions? And more importantly, one of them was said to have existed unknowingly to the Nigerian Navy for nine <laughs> years. Like, how is this even possible? But then, so, in, in my frustration, I then had to ask myself, like, okay, how did we end up with bandits? And I'm sorry that I'm kind of bringing banditry into this. You know, it was the only analogy I could use to be able to make sense of that headline and the stories around it, like, look, okay, if we could have, you know, non-state actors taking over sweat of the Nigerian state, then it makes sense, on land, that is, then it makes sense that we potentially could also have non-state actors taking over national infrastructure, both on land, and in the seas. So. so that's on one side. Then the other side of it is um, I, I've been asking myself, I mean, given my knowledge of metering, I've been asking myself, like, how is this possible? I know that each of the oil companies that produce out of Nigerian fields would have meters. Yeah. They would meter everything they produce. And that oil before it is transported to whichever terminal they go, I don't know, the land terminals or the FPSOs, you know, the, the ships, they will be metered. Like, you know, you would know how much. And then when it gets to the destination, it will also be metered. So if the theft is happening between the two points, yeah. then I'm asking myself, how come nobody's kind of asking themselves, like, okay, there's a difference between what we produce versus what's received at the terminal. Where, where, is, the, where is the problem? So a lot, of, uh, a lot of the headline around this, it goes back to what we were saying earlier. At some point, you begin to wonder, 
if you know if people think we're children because you know some of these things they think that you can only say to like five-year-olds and you know it's like fair, it sounds very much like a fairy tale and i i'm sure you can see my excitement in the way i'm talking about it it's because it's so impossible to rationalize these headlines as in they make no sense it's like somebody telling you a fairy tale like somebody telling okay. you santa claus exists <laughs> well, uh, uh, quickly, uh, Ms. Okbuyejo, where the deed has been done, uh, but now at least uh, 58 illegal pipelines have been discovered uh, by Mr. Government uh, Pemopolo, aka Tompolo, in Delta and Bayesa states, uh, where uh, crude oil is, was being stolen, or is being stolen, that I don't know. Uh, but does that mean we're winning uh, these fights against saboteurs? So, without speaking, so without speaking to the um, the efficacy of uh, Topolo's methods, all I can say is that it's either the it's either the Nigerian state never had any security architecture to secure those infrastructure to begin with, okay. or it is in Kahoot with those who are stealing it. And Mr. Tompolo is like outside of that network and it's easy for him to come up and say, look, this is what I've found. But the idea that this has been there and nobody's aware, I, I find that really difficult to wrap my head around. Like I said, it sounds very much like fairy tales. Somebody's not telling us the full story of exactly what's happened in the past and what is presently happening. Okay. And I, and I would look at that. All okay. right. Oh. Now let me come to uh, whatever here. And um, because some people have even said this pipeline discovery is like Mongo Park telling us Mongo Park discovered Niger, uh, River Niger. That River Niger has been there all along. He was just, he just discovered it. That this thing has been going on and people know, you know, so it's just bringing it to the fore. Now, is there any hope in sight? Is this how, because it's, when you want to take an inventory of all that we have discussed here now, we have looked at the, the, the theft, we have looked at you know, the oil theft, we have looked at you know, subsidy, we have looked at pipeline vandalization, we have looked at so many other you know, points in there. And then you ask yourself, is Nigeria really broke? Can we really say we are broke? Because with the volume of with the quantum of money that is being lost every day? Well, well, is there well, any hope in sight? There is hope. Nigeria is too rich to be poor. Nigeria has no business to be poor. God is even angry with us because of what we are doing. We are not making use of the resources, the divine resources given to us to maximally to benefit uh, the people. Nigeria is a country of possibilities and impossibilities. Many things that are not, that can never happen in advanced countries of the, are happening here. But we still have the same, same system, we still have the same policy, but it is the people okay. that uh, it, all these things that we have submitted are man-made to me. And then there is hope for this country. Uh, I think a uh, lawyer has just said recently okay. that there is a sort of surveillance equipment that has been bought over the years, okay. costing, I think he said, uh, billions of naira. Yeah. I forgot the name of the lawyer, very popular lawyer. Uh, Femi Falano. Femi Falano. He said it. So the surveillance equipments have been there all along. Uh, all these things have been taking place yeah. all along. They are man made. Another thing that we have to note here is that the right of way of these uh, pipelines yeah. have been taken over because they have now uh, move, uh, they are not building uh, I, I think uh, can, something has just ex extended to, uh, to take the place you see all these pipelines that we are talking about in the past were far 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 in the forest okay. but they have moved towards that to the extent that, to the extent that the people are now enc encroaching okay. on the okay. pipeline itself now, it is, it, it, it is a sort of collaborative efforts of people. 
it is as a result of, of a result of network connection there and there. And if one is not careful, uh, one may pay uh, the price. If one has to look into that, it is those people in power yeah. that you have to address the situation. And if they address it, there's, there's a, uh, there is hope for this country. Like what we are now hearing now, it's even more than 60, 60 okay, locations yeah. uh, recently yeah. that Tumpula has just uh, discovered. discovered. Uh, so it's not a new thing, but let us thank God for bringing Topolo to this, uh, to, uh, to this place and for God to have actually used him to... But he didn't pay it, it's not God. If you are paid <laughs> and you are able to do your work to the, to the extent that okay. what you have done covers the cost of what is given to you okay. and it has a lot of profit or uh, mm -hmm. uh, gain in it, it's still okay in accounting and economics. You see, it's just like this. What is the cost of doing this, this business, of doing this contract? Okay. What will be the, uh, end, result. the end result of it? If the end, end result justifies the money, I think it's still okay. And then yeah. we can move forward. And then if what actually we, we recovered from that source is now being used to develop the other cost sectors of the economy, mm. people will benefit from it. Mm. So it is still in order. You see, what? as we have said, we have also, uh, uh, over the years, we have recommended that all the, uh, all the loopholes must be addressed in this industry, not only in this, this industry alone, in so many other areas. Yes. And then the discovery is a right step in the right direction, direction. provided the end result will justify it. Because uh, all along in the past, the various uh, outcomes of, uh, of investigations were never, okay. never, uh, were never uh, made use of. Okay. So, I think God is passing through this, this country and all the secret measures that are inimical to the progress of this country, God is now revealing them. Okay. And I, I believe very soon, God will take us uh, to the promised land. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Ms. Okuboyejo, it remains uh, to be seen if uh, Tumpule can actually do this alone, because even more disturbing, uh, that one of the legal pipelines uh, discovered was close to a security post, you know, less than one kilometer from the uh, Focado's export terminal. So it appears there are many more that are yet to be discovered. So, so, so remember in my earlier submission, I, what I said was, you know, for, there are one of one of two, one of two, three, two. Um, one of two scenarios is true. So it's either we never had any kind of formal security architecture for this critical national infrastructure to begin with, in which case, if, that, if we never had it, then discoveries, believe me, I, I believe that there will be more discoveries ahead. So it's, that's one scenario. Second scenario is that, well, all the surveillance equipment's there, the, 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 um, the policies are there, the systems are there. However, those that are still in it are the same people that are being asked to protect it. So in which case, they now have to justify, you know, the job that they've been given. And now that they've been given a job formally, you know, it makes sense for them to say this has been discovered that I don't know which of it is true. But one of those two scenarios is true. And like I said, it feels a lot to me like the, the Nigerian state has, you know, submitted itself to being taken over both on land and on sea. I mean, I, I still cannot think of any other way to rationalize this other than that. So now you've got You've got bandits on land. Now you've got kind of people you can call pirates, okay. even though we call them thefts, but, you know, like pirates on the sea who are, like, stealing. I mean, after all, if you think about it, bandits are collecting taxes from people on land. So it's only fair that the pirates on the sea are stealing, you know, our resources to, to enrich themselves. And I don't know. I mean, this is very, it's, it's very, very embarrassing and frustrating to, to, to think about. All right. Well, well uh, I want to thank you very much. I think we gradually have to bring this to a close now. Um, 
because of this whole situation, I, I, I even wanted us to look at, okay, we've talked about the national theft. How about the mini petrol stations? You go to this petrol station, when they said for you 10 liters, you know, you go to another petrol station, you find another one that is, you know, and then you are asking yourself, is there no regulatory agency? Is there, you know, what exactly is going on? I wish we could go on and there on. Are, there, are so, <laughs> there are so many regulatory agencies. They go to petrol stations, they monitor, they do all sorts of things. Yet, the, the problem persists. So, like I said earlier, the systems are there. It is those people that are monitoring, monitoring the system that are not doing the exactly. right thing. So that is just it. They are overriding control. They are overriding the system. Mm -hmm. It is a network. Mm -hmm. Like when I was at Ikene, I saw that state of, okay. I witnessed about two or three incidences. The one that was great was at Ogiri. Okay. The thing was coming out. They just uh, punched the, the pipeline. Right. And then the petrol was go gushing out more than 40 feet high, uh, spread like it was just a rainfall. I was shortling between Mosimi and that particular place okay. before that thing can be addressed. So it's a network, you see, and it was only the, the time they were pumping, because okay. if they are not pumping okay. and the, the thing is punched, the thing will not be effective. So there's, a, mm. there's an information that... That is what I'm saying, but there's a network the network must be broken. And before you can break the network, it is the poverty level. It is the, uh, uh, the conducive environment that allows that. The uh, government has to address a lot of things before this thing can actually be eradicated. But, but, but mm -hmm. are we also seeing enough uh, punitive measures? Uh, in some climes, uh, by now, uh, well, some controllers, some uh, professional experts in the sector would have been sacked. Uh, some would have res resigned. Oh, well, that depends on government because I'm not okay. part of them. So, like, you also want to say something? Ah, it's okay. Let's, let's it's okay. You wanted to say something as you close quickly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I, I like what uh, uh, Mr. Ojeomi said there about punitive measures. So as long as these things continue and there's no consequences, as far as I'm concerned it's always going to, to continue. The people who perpetrate this are not ghosts. They are among us and they live within us. So, All right, we want to yes, thank we you. Do. We have EFCC, <laughs> we have so many other well, organizations that, that should right. have come in. <laughs> By now, but they are well, not doing it. The answer, <laughs> thank God. the answer is blowing in the wind. Yeah, we want to thank you very <laughs> much this morning. We're trying to investigate oil theft in Nigeria and the implications and um, our team of experts here, they've really done a very good job. I want to thank all the way from the United Kingdom via Zoom, uh, oil and gas expert, Tayo Kuboyejo. Thank you very much for being part of this discussion this morning. Thank you for bringing me in. Thank you. All right, and then Chief Odebo, man of many parts, chartered <laughs> accountant, expert in management, and then oil. I hope we are putting oil into your resume now. So many, <laughs> various sectors of the economy. We right. give glory to God. Thank you very much for being part of this program yeah. this morning. All right. <laughs> <laughs>